welcome everyone to our uh, live stream. Actually, we're not even sure if this is working. Um, we're doing this for the first time. We're using a new uh, software called Restream Studio. And um, it's giving us a lot more control over how we project the conversations that we have, like having a funky background. Like I have the power of actually getting rid of uh, Rabbi Hadjoff and then adding him back in. I could change the uh, the uh, the uh, screen ratio to kind of be like two covers like this side by side. I could add up to 10 people like this. Um, so there's a lot of really cool uh, features here. Um, you know, we want you to, if you can, to uh, follow us um, on uh, YouTube. Um, you can follow us on YouTube at YouTube slash C slash Chazak. Um, you know, we are posting all this information there. This should be streaming live on Facebook. Um, there should be a way for you to chat with us, although I'm not really sure how it works. But anyway, um, Rabbi Hadjov, did you check to see if this is uh, being broadcasted anywhere on uh, I'm gonna Facebook? Go, I'm going to go right now to Indeed. Facebook and figure that out. Should see be on uh, my page, should be on the uh, Chazak NY page and on the uh, Edmund J. Safra page. Here I go. And yeah, we're on right now. Yeah, we're on. We are live. We're live. I'm going to share it on my page as well, if I can. Let's you should be able to. Let's... Doesn't need much bandwidth. Okay, it's happening. Yay! All right, awesome. All right. Boom. Uh, what's that? You're on. All right. Do you want to begin? We're dealing with a question tonight. Question is, is it worth spending all of that money to go to Mars? I mean, we're spending $2.5 billion to build a little robot to fly it to another planet when you could be spending $2.5 billion in uh, you know, helping people that are needy, people that are hungry, people that, are have, that, need, that need surgeries. There's so many other better usage for those funds. Why spend it? and sending a rocket to Mars. Well, before we look into the other things we could be spending the money on, because there's always other things to spend money on, you know, there's health, we're in the middle of Corona, God willing, come to the, near the end of it. But um, spending money in space exploration is not a new story. It's been going on for, at this point, for decades. Um, and as we know, there's been a lot of positive stuff that's come out of this. First, we have to figure out why. Why are they spending so much time and money and effort for us to reach anywhere in space, let alone Mars, which this is not the first mission up there. They've sent other things there over the decades that we've been doing space exploration. The big question is, Rabbi, I think, is what is our obsession um, here in America and China and Russia especially, remember the space race between United States and Russia in those days, what is this desire for us to go and conquer these new frontiers? What exactly is the purpose of it? So it seems to be a few things that are going on over here which, which stand out. The first thing is, and it sounds a little weird, but space exploration is cool and it's a status symbol. And we see all these billionaires, as soon as they become billionaires, they're into space. Yeah, you got the Elon Musk, you know, and you got the Jeff Bezos. See me once you acquire a lot of money, you want to hit space. And I was wondering why. Was there a obsession? Did they always have this, uh, you know, excitement about space? Maybe they did. Maybe well, you know, nerds that watch uh, Star Trek and Star Wars as kids. But there's a certain status symbol that you know what we've done Earth. Let's do somewhere else. That seems to be part of it. Hmm. You know, I I think that there's definitely that's part of it but you know i think that this whole space exploration insanity started with the uh cold war between russia and america yeah. um and it was when J john f kennedy you know said you know after the russians put their uh spaceman in space um they said we're gonna go to the moon and that's the whole idea of a moonshot you know like we're going to the moon we're gonna get to the moon and um you know and they did it they actually pulled it off they uh, were able to do it and it wasn't an easy feat to uh, to get there now and listen it's, it's a lot of money as well i mean as you said we're talking over the years this mission is to enough billion 
but they've been working on Mars for a long time. This has been the vision, you know, and as I said, there's a certain status symbol that comes with, hey, we got, we got some live audio, which just came out today or yesterday. Did you hear it? It was very spooky. They have audio from Mars for the first time. I'll tell you what I heard. A Chabad house asking for a minion. <laughs> so, so um, what's um, you know, putting old jokes aside, I have, I have, I have two ways of like thinking about this, and I want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I have two. They're both well, ones are a religious answer. Why, why, why space? Why are these guys going to space? Um, and I, I think it goes back to Genesis. Everything goes back to Genesis for me. God says, you know, that He creates man in the image. Uh, man's created in the image of God, and He tells humanity. Puru urvu umulu et aretz ve kid shuha, right? And God says more than that. Rudu with the gatayam uvofa shemaim. He God gives a command to humanity to explore the earth or to explore the universe, which means there's a natural drive, a curiosity that we have to understand the world that we live in. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt about it. There's a natural curiosity, and that's why these people have it. They want to know what's out there. They want to know. That's why alien life, as we've discussed before, is so popular. But I think going back to Adam and Eve is a good place because it's the origins of the universe. Another reason they're putting so much money, time, and effort is there's a natural desire to know if there's any purpose to life. Right. And that, for us, you know, the Jewish people, that's our residential. What is the purpose of what's our mission in life? For the scientific community, which overlaps in many cases with the religious community, let's see it, right? Let's have a look if we can find the origins of the universe. So one of the reasons they're trying to go to Mars, I mean, it doesn't really make too much sense because that's only one little small area of the universe, but supposedly that's going to give us some other glimpse into the origins of the universe itself. So that's another big motivator for a lot of people out there. So the cool factor for sure, but hey, where do we come from? And what came, was there anything before us? And what's come kind of after us? Because there's a part of this of, you know, if Earth becomes uninhabitable, we need somewhere else to go, All right? So we'll take this, what is it, six, seven month journey up to Mars. Although personally, I don't know, Ed, I've seen video and audio. It looks better and sounds better on Earth. <laughs> it's definitely, I mean, if you, uh, you know, every space film you've ever seen, and when you see these, you know, spacecraft coming back to the Earth, there's nothing as remarkably beautiful as looking at that bluey white sky of the Earth. And you know, there's actually a famous uh, professor of a uh, comparative religion named Joseph Campbell, who believed that um, every religion, every society, always had an icon that uh, described what the aspiration of the society was. And he really believed that in the future generations, as we kind of get more technologically advanced, that the icon for humanity should be the planet Earth itself as a way of grounding us, like uniting us. Like we're from one planet, we're from one people, we're all under one roof. Forget the countries, forget the languages. All that stuff is nonsense, but we're all part of this beautiful, big blue bubble, you know, literally this blue bubble. Look and for us huge people. We do see the world that way. You know, we see ourselves as one entire world under God. When Mashiach comes, there's going to be this absolute unity that's going to pervade the entire earth. So I believe this is also in preparation uh, for that day as well. But you said something very interesting. You said when they came back from earth, we all remember moon landings or the videos we've seen or movies we've seen or space exploration or space shows. You know, I grew up on a steady diet of Star Trek, you know, yeah. at the universe with Jewish boys, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, who picked this up by being in synagogue. Everyone's seen the video of him, you know, the Cohen blessing. But there's something else over here, and that is a lot of children's interest in science. I am coming doctors that, you know, we Jews have a fair amount of doctors out there. They say it starts from this, right? The idea of explore, exploring the world, right? And exploring the universe and exploring outside of our comfort zone um, scientifically gives people a lot of real uh, desire to be interested in the sciences. Because science, listen, for me, science in high school was pretty boring, you know? But 
exploring the universe and understand the technology that goes into that, that was a very exciting thing. So I think for us, there's a, a strong part of it that, uh, that gives us this excitement to get kids involved, exciting, excited, and wanting to, uh, to be part of this whole scientific uh, world um, that this Mars exploration has just become the tip of it. I mean, let's think about it for a second, you know. We've taken on, we've taken on a world that is millions of miles away, right? How many miles? I think it's 330 million, something crazy amount of Fathom yeah. it. I mean, the closest I get to it is, is Manhattan traffic, right? That's the amount of like six months. I give, If you've been in Manhattan traffic, you can understand the amount of time. But just ex putting that into your brain and downloading it, we've sent something from this earth, hundreds of millions of miles, took seven months to get there and it landed safely. I'm like, science is cool. Right? There's a lot of kids out there are like, you know what, maybe I should listen to science a bit more so I can be part of that mission. Actually, one of the kids who was actually involved in this is a 22-year-old recent graduate. He almost didn't, he didn't accept it to a lot of schools. And he's like, I just landed something on Mars. I was part of this mission. He saw this whole article about the yeah. young boy. So it changes people's lives. It brings an interest which normally you know, isn't there. And as any educator, it wants is kids to be excited about um, life, universe. Yeah, you're saying it's much more than just being exciting. There's something about a moonshot. There's something about overcoming an obstacle that seems impossible, that motivates us, that inspires us, that dreaming about the stars and conquering space is just like, it's magical. It's like, you know, it's the stuff that's, that legends and stories are made up of today. Um, and um, I, I think that there is something unique about having this dream to like leave the island that you're on, you know, like Christopher Columbus, but if you think of it like this, Christopher Columbus getting on that ship was tantamount to leaving for Mars. Oh, a thousand percent, yeah. You know, him no crossing the Atlantic and finding that was West. Some yeah. say for the first ever time, you know, right? there'd been this breakup in the world and he was reuniting it and bringing parts of the world that had never been connected in centuries. So that was a very, very, very big thing that he did. And no matter what you think about him, I know there's big backlash against him, which I think is ridiculous because in his day, you know, he did something unbelievable. You can't deny that. So this was the, that was the Mars mission. This is, this is the Columbus um, story of, uh, of, of our day. There's no doubt about it. So the question is, is it worth it? <coughs> Very nice. You get to inspire a bunch of kids to have stories and to get them to become scientists and doctors. But is it worth the price tag? We spent billions, if not trillions of dollars in sending up satellites and setting up you know, uh, uh, people to, 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 uh, to uh, what's it called, to the moon. There's more missions going to the moon. You have Elon Musk, Virgin Atlantic, uh, all these big companies that want to privatize space travel. Disney is already talking about building a like a, ma a magic mountain on the moon. They, no. want to, they want to build an amusement park on the moon by 2035. They want to have a way. You know what? I, got a, I got a story. I know a friend of mine actually wants to do a bar mitzvah on the moon. And he did it. And he came back. I said, how was it? He said, there's no atmosphere. <laughs> That's actually not true. There is no one moon joke. Hope you enjoyed it. There's an atmosphere, it's just very little. So it's very little gravity, also. Um, yeah, but uh, more on Mars, though, I think they have um, there's, there's more on Mars. I there's think. a lot more on Mars, yes. Uh, there's a lot more on Mars. Moons are different than uh, planets because of their because of their atmosphere. Uh, every planet has its own gravitational pull. The gravity of a planet depends on the weight and the mass of the planet, which is where the gravity comes from. So since the moon itself has mass. It has its own level of gravity, which is much less than the Earth because of the size of the Earth versus the size of the Moon. Anyway, boring stuff. But uh, the uh, the idea is, you know, is it worth the expense? So that's that's a fair question. Let's just go through first of all, just recap. So first of all, there's a scientific aspect to this. It gets kids excited in science, helps us figure out the origins of the universe. Possibly, there's great inventions for society that come out of this NASA work of space uh, moon exploration, it's cool, right? It's just, it get, there's a status to America, United States, and it gives us prominence in the world and more people are gonna wanna come here and hang out in this very cool country that sends people to Mars. You know what I'm saying? There's some, there's a cool aspect to it. But if you're putting billions of dollars into that, you're not putting out 
it does sound like a lot of money, right? It does sound like a lot of money. Let's be honest, though. In the scale of things in America, it's not actually not that much. I mean, what percentage of our, I don't know, GDP, right, our gross domestic product goes towards, I don't know the percentage, but it's probably pretty small. I don't know if billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, but in the scheme of things, it could be that what you get out of it outweighs the costs. So you're advocating for it. I'm, I'm like, you know what? It's very easy to say, you know, take all that money, two and a half billion dollars just to send this road up to space and put it towards cancer charities or hospitals. It's hard to argue against that because that's an emotional argument. I can make an emotional argument about anything, right? There's starving people and, and there's real problems here in America. But to say, just take that money and that's going to solve those problems, first of all, I'm not so sure because a lot of money is thrown towards those other things. Right. There is a scientific angle that we, as America, because America is a rich country, like a really, really rich country. Yeah. That's not <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, Israel is nowhere near as rich and it's trying to get out to space as well. You know what I'm saying? And trying to do its own. Well, it's doing things that uh, countries aren't, that are, you know, like, I mean, there are, I mean, India didn't have a space craft out. I think, you know, India is actually one of them, but like, I think, I think London, England, the UK, I think was not in the space race at all. No. Um, I don't think countries that are significantly larger with their GDP and population. But, you know, put that aside for a second. You know, like there's a, um, there's a great quote. And this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, uh, I'm going to argue why it's a bad idea. You know, I think I, I prefer taking your argument. There's a great quote from Ratzadika Cohen in Lublin, who was a uh, famous, uh, 18th century uh, Hasidic, 19th century Hasidic rabbi. It's a genius. And he says like this, he says, there's going to come a time in man's history where they're going to have the ability to reach the farthest stars in the universe. But at the same time, they're going to lose the ability to look within themselves. Right. Yeah. And I think that the, the, um, the negative effect of looking outward is that you forget about looking inward. It reminds me of something else. There's a famous piece by Rev Cook, who was a uh, another famous rabbi, uh, the early uh, early uh, 19th century, and um, you know he said like this. He believed that you know people should become vegetarians. He was himself a vegetarian. On Shabbat, though, he had a little bit of meat, not typical uh, vegetarian. But the reason why he encouraged people not to completely become vegetarians is because he believed that the only way we could reach a sensitivity where we can't eat animals is when we reach a sensitivity where we can't hurt human beings first. Mm. That, 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 that we're trying to create a messianic reality by taking a shortcut and not caring for people. And by the way, how many times have you seen individuals who care about the whales, but couldn't right. care less about the guy next door? I mean, Hitler, he was nice to his dogs. Yeah, nice, to, very nice to his dogs. He was also vegetarian, by the way. He was also vegetarian. So look, I, I hear that. I'm going, to, I'm going to say that there's another problem as well, which in terms of relationships, I always say that you have this object millions of miles away, hundreds of millions of miles away, and we're able with flick and switch to move it around. So we've taken full control of the world and now the universe, moons, planets, and we think to ourselves, well, then obviously I can control my wife who's you know next to me over here and my kids were down the hall over there. Right, and my friends over there, and my employees, my employers over here. So one of the downsides is we feel <laughs> we can control other people, but people are machines. So we're losing that idea of you're not in control, right? And one of the ideas of life is we're not in control, right? God's in control, and this mixing up of controlling everything around us and science and nature, right? But why am I not getting that results from, from my own personal relationships? That could be very, very problematic. So I hear that. I hear that. Mm -hmm. Again, you're trying, we're trying to answer an emotional question with a rational answer, right? Emotionally, there's people starving. How can you take all that money and there's people dying of starvation? There's people are freezing cold running out of Texas. You know what I'm saying? There's people who don't have electricity and we're here spending that money over there. That's an emotional argument. Well, well, it's not a rational argument. Why is that emotional? Why? One second. Why is that emotional? Don't we have a a ethical, moral responsibility to take care of poor people and people that are in need? Absolutely. 
My point is what you cannot do in this argument is, therefore we give everything else up just to feed these people. You know what I'm saying? Is there enough money to take care of those people? Yeah, there is. Does that mean we have to give up on every other desire that we have? You're a rabbi, okay? Like me, we get phone calls all day, every day. Every I get day. emails, it's just, so one minute, I could literally be, I mean, even I'm speaking to you, I got four WhatsApp messages, I'm not even kidding, of people messaging me. With, so yeah, hey, what am I talking to you for? I could be here dealing with people's problems. But the answer is that there's more to life. There's other stuff going on in the world. We've got to, we've got to space ourselves. Oh, there you go. Right? Excuse the pun. Space ourselves out a little bit in order to look at a broader. There's a broader picture. So I could be on 24 hours a day helping people, but then how do I get my own personal development, my own growth? Where does that come in? How does that manifest itself? So I hear that argument is people starving, and we should fix that. But I don't know if we should be giving up on other great adventures like this thing to Mars, which, I mean, no one can deny is an absolutely amazing thing. I just don't think it has to be one and not the other. We have Rabbi Farhi trying to join us right there. Oh, my goodness. But I, I, he might be using... Space exploration. <laughs> he might be using his phone to try to get on. Mm. I, I think it doesn't work well with a, uh, a phone browser. I think he has a computer browser. Let me tell him. Yeah, let him know. But again, I, I hear that argument. I think that's it's an important argument. I think that ultimately what we're what you're saying is that um, you know while yes, of course we have a responsibility to um, care for uh, the people on planet Earth, we still have a responsibility obligation to. Um, you know, um, develop ourselves, evolve, you know, create a opportunities for the uh, furthering of our knowledge of the universe and space and so on and so forth. Um, and that I think is a good argument. And we know that there are all kinds of positive things that came out as a result of the space race, um, laser, GPS, internet, um, the, uh, what's it called? Um, Teflon. Um, Teflon, microwave. Um, so many of that, uh, so much, so much of that technology okay. came out as a result of the, the scientific breakthroughs that have come through this incredible research of these geniuses in NASA. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Once again, I mean, there's always going to be people hungry. There's always going to be people thirsty, and there's always going to be people. Need, I mean, according to this, then you know, let's break down this entire program and buy more books for schools. It doesn't. That doesn't really work. Yeah. Got to find some other way. I think we have. Oh, Rafari, are, are you with us? Turn on your computer. Hello. Hello. Oh, we can hear uh, uh, you. We have we have contact. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, doesn't look like it's allowing me to use. I hold on a second. Maybe there's, if a, I can setting, there's a settings uh, button on the bottom right. Let's see if we got it. Access to your uh, camera. Are you on your phone? Or are you in a, there you go. What's up, guys? How are you doing? Baruch Hashem. Doing well. yeah. so, we have our surprise oh, guest over here. Hi, in the house. This is very cool. Okay, so, you know, um, this is let's jump straight in. We're discussing right now. Do you want to take billions of dollars and pump it into exploring space and Mars when that money could have been spent on food, electricity, and other amazing things around the United States? It takes more time. both ways. Look, I mean, you guys are smart enough to have argued the uh, the obvious the obvious points. I think well. Um, the real question I have to say is a now versus later approach, you know, and when people are thinking in the now, so it's very hard to make any sort of argument for space exploration when we we have so many problems here. Like, what are we doing? And I think in truth, in the beginning of this story, like, you know, if you listen, go back and listen historically to the presidents uh, when they talked about exploring space. Did you guys ever listen? Uh, to the you know to Kennedy and you know sure, and those sure. did you guys, did you guys, yeah did you guys play that no we didn't play it all right so it's actually worth playing because you know what they were talking about was you know some 
amorphous, really cool thing. Like, you know what? If we can go see space, let's go see space. Nothing more than that. Like some sort of adventure, like, you know, because it's out there. We climb it because we can, you know? It's exciting. There's an excitement that yeah, comes yeah. through. Exciting. It's very exciting. But you know what? When people are starving, you don't get to play exciting. You know, that's just not, you know, it doesn't rise. There's always when people hungry. There's always when people who are thirsty. Then do we give up on every dream we have? So, right? So I agree with you. The only thing here is, and this is where I think it gets a little bit fuzzy, is that we're no longer talking about, um, you know, just something being exciting. We're talking about actually using this space exploration, you know, as potential opportunity for people to move to space. I mean, you know, the fact that we had just this week up in Mars, you know, this drone flying around Mars. I mean, it's not a normal thing that when this is where we are now, like, you know, um, and um, I think that that's a really kind of, this is, like a, this is like a page turner when, you know, the Chinese got involved, the U.S. is now kind of stepping up the mission. It's no longer something which is just about fueling people's excitement and, you know, pure, you know, science experiments, which, by the way, is an argument in and of itself. Some of these experiments that we've done in outer space, with, where it's the only place to run those experiments, are providing unbelievable usage back here on Earth. So the only way you could do that is if you do it from there. But I'm saying even aside from that, you know, people are talking about space travel today like they, they want to be talking about a trip to Florida, you know, uh, 20 years ago. You know, they want to get to a stage where they're taking, you know, mass amounts of people and eventually trying to find a way to colonize Mars. Now, is that going to happen? Who knows? But you know what? There's a lot of places on Earth that were not inhabitable, you know, 100 years ago. Even if you think about Israel, you know, uh, and all the people that are living there now, if you read a lot of the early Zionist writings, you know, it was a swamp. It was full of mosquitoes, malaria. You couldn't, you couldn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a place you could tame. And yet with advancements in, you know, in science and technology and industry, we've been able to kind of make that place, you know, uh, a place of a habitat for humanity. If that's the case. So, you know, it might be that we're looking at a, uh, a time in, in history where that is something which is relevant. And I want to share with you one last thought. You know, well, I think I'm CNN right now, by the way. It's like a, it's like a <laughs> I agree with these guys over here. Not with this guy. Uh, you're losing your place over there. There you go. Uh, <laughs> or it can mean be me no, be small. Oh, shit. Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, which I think is is um is quite an interesting way of of considering this, and that is that, um, you know, uh, it really makes you wonder. You think about why in the world did God make so many planets that are irrelevant? You know, for the vast majority of human history, and these are places that stood there. And what did they do? What was their purpose? What was their function? Billions of stars trillions of stars of galaxies and, and and we only live in one of them i mean i know that you guys dealt with that in your alien segment maybe there isn't but there's so many planets that don't have life on them why would god make them unless there was a purpose to it so i wonder if if uh, us exploring these these spaces is you know god in heaven is like Finally, <laughs> you know, I put these out there, you know, you guys had the challenge. Nobody tried the Kugel, like, you know, you, 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 you inhabited this one, but, you know. It nobody... a round Kugel, not a square one, because we're dealing with planets, Rabbi, just to be very clear. I think we've only discovered the round ones, you know. I, I would not be surprised if in time we find triangular. Uh... But, <laughs> that's, why I said, I, that's why I, I have to agree with you. I think this whole idea of this emotional argument, there's people hungry, people starving. It's not one, they're not mutually exclusive, you know. And if that problem needs to be solved, it can be solved. But taking away this idea of, of excitement or growth, I mean, what would America be like today if we hadn't, you know, been on the moon? It's become so much part of who we are, our culture. And think about the excitement that comes from all these people. I've got the Elon Musks, but people are thinking, you know what, we did that, we went to a planet. 
you know what? I can start a company, right? There's a certain movement that we feel as a people, as a country, an excitement that we have the financial resources and the brain power in order to create this unbelievable movement into another far reach of the universe. It adds to your culture. It becomes part of your history, your culture. It gives people a, a sounds weird, but a reason to live. You know, there's a lot of power that comes from this incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I wasn't a good time growing up, but it excites me when I think about it. It can't come at the expense of not caring for the uh, the people on planet Earth. Meaning, if the space exploration becomes the uh, the reason that are the the, re the force behind everything that I do, right? That's a problem. Right. It's OK to have a moonshot if it's motivating you uh, to uh, grow your uh, understanding of the universe, your science, mathematics and so on and so forth. But it can't come at the expense of, well, we no longer have money to care for the sick and the needy and the poor. And I, well, I can, can, can I ask you one question on that point, though, Ruben, because, yeah. you know, we have been not taking care of our poor for thousands of years without moonshots. You know, what did we do? Um, we bought a car that had 800 horsepower instead of 500 horsepower. And before cars, we were not taking care of the poor um, by hitching another horse to the, a third horse to the carriage to put more horsepower in front of our wagon. And before that, we were not taking care of the poor because we were spending money on, you know, on gold or whatever, you know, nose rings for our wives and children. There will always be a reason that we have why we can spend money on something other than the poor. Like maybe instead of, you know, not having this thing, which might actually provide a, tr a tremendous amount of good. Maybe we should take that money from Xboxes and uh, and sports cars and yeah, luxury vacations. And I kind of feel like there's something here which is intrinsically valuable both in terms of the concept, the shooting for the moon concept that people get from it, and also for potential advancements in terms of habitat and materials and um, and scientific knowledge. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we, we don't have to take care of the poor. We'll always find reasons locally. Uh, you know, I'll buy super expensive cheese for $200 from imported from France. Like, you know, go, go down the street in Manhattan, you'll find, you know, Five thousand, ten thousand dollars suits. There's, there's another aspect is that we, the Jewish people, believe there's something to be said for just studying and learning for the sake of learning, right? We say there's something to it. Lishma, I just do it. We study Jewish philosophy, we talk about it, it brings us closer to Hashem. This in the secular world, but even for us, this can have a major impact on us learning and growing as a people, just even like mental wise in terms of our thinking and understanding. So why study philosophy? Everyone should be studying, you know, how to be a plumber, how to do accountancy and Dayeno. What are we, what are we messing around with, with philosophy for? Same thing, there's something to be said of expanding our minds, of learning, understanding. Why do we study poetry? You know, we could stop all poetry and all novels, just cut them away and just study practical stuff. Yeah, right? And there's no richness in life. We've lost so much of what it is, right, to be a, to be a human. So we Jewish people are the first ones to say there's something which is studying Lama Seh for action and Lishma, right? Just for the sake of it. So in that world, and by the way, they you know they said the famous story of the two astronauts, the Russian astronaut, cosmonaut, and the American astronaut, and the Russian astronaut went up and said, We see we're up in space, there's no God. And the uh, American answer was, wow, look at God's beautiful creations, beautiful as you said, blue bubble that we can get to and appreciate. Right? So we've now expanded an appreciation of God's universe, right? It's not just some distant star planet. Now we can have a full appreciation of the inf the idea of infinity, right, is now something that we're having a little better grasp of by being involved in a planet 330 million miles away, and we are just moving a millimeter in our universe. The idea of God's infinity is is now a little bit closer to our minds. We have a little bit more of an understanding of it. Yeah, again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do space. I'm, I'm, I'm like the biggest space nerd ever. Like I want, if, if I could, when there's a commercial flight to go to space, like, I, 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 I want to go to space. I'm, 
I want to go to the moon. I want to go to the, to a magic mountain on the moon. You're like, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm By not way, saying that we shouldn't do that. You're a roller coaster. It'll like fly off the moon. There's no gravity. It'll end up in the middle of the universe. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting, though. I mean, I think as well, what if there's some sort of confluence between these two things? Like, you know, um, when you talk about people that are underprivileged or the world's problems, what if going to space is part of the answer to that equation? Like, you know, you don't have enough space, so you don't have, so people are cramped, cramping causes, this cramped space causes violence, it causes animosity, it causes problems of, you know, land ownership, you now triple, quadruple, 100 times the size of Earth. And all you need to do is get people there. And then there's unlimited, uh, virtually unlimited space. You know, you, you solve a lot of that. I mean, I think that's a interesting right. thing. What if, what if part of bringing Mashiach to this world is discovering another one? That's so that the nation don't have to fight anymore. You know me, I can just like send him off to Mars. I'm like, you know what? There's no room for you over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got you one day, a one week ticket to Mars. Shalom. There's an in law section. <laughs> a one way ticket to Mars. Listen, I think I think that ultimately, when it comes to technology, you know, I give you like a crude example, like what's going on today with like Bitcoin and like the government's trying to figure out how to evaluate it how to be taxed and so on and so forth. Why should I go to work if I could just invest my money right now in Bitcoin and just ride that wave, right? There is this idea of Yishuv Olam, okay? Yishuv Olam is the idea in, in the Talmud that, you know, it's a Tikkun Olam, the idea that we have responsibility to um, to um, expand our, settle to settle the earth, to build bridges, to create an economy, to create governments and so on and so forth. Why? Not just for the sake of expansion, but for the sake of improving the lives of humanity. So if space exploration is designed with the intention of, um, you know, uh, getting rid of poverty, of increasing our scientific knowledge, of, you know, giving humanity the ability of, you know, learning more and appreciating God's universe, then I don't have a problem with it. My concern is just like Bitcoin is a technology that's there to help, that's designed to... Um, you know, help us move money quickly to create a new asset of value, a decentralized currency, and all the benefits of all those things, it also has the opposite effect in there as well. So my concern is always that opposite effect. I'm not saying we shouldn't have technology. I'm just saying that when we're doing these things, we have to, just like the internet, when, you know, like in, depending on which circles you were, there are people that said internet is evil, you can never have it, it's here we are. <laughs> you know, like it's a necessity today. No schools can function without internet today. There's just, was, it's not happening. But we, we're not going to lie to ourselves and say there's no evils with internet. We're not going to say, well, there are no negative things. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. All my point is that we just got to be careful when we're, we're, we're creating this new moonshot, we're building this new technology. We have to be ready for the negative effects these technologies are going to have on us as a people, us as individuals, and as society, and so on and so forth. Look, you, you're, raising, you're raising a very good point. And I think what makes the point even more uh, valid is the fact that, you know, when a government uh, spearheads an, an, an initiative, like if America was spearheading this initiative, so ultimately there would be some checks and balances, you know, they'd have to answer in front of Congress, in front of the Senate, in front of the president, in front of world opinion. They'd have to answer, like, why are we doing this? Why don't we make choice A, B, or C? How does that fit with the mission statement? Right mm -hmm. now, this is actually being pushed hardest by entrepreneurial, like, uh, yeah. you know, entrepreneurial spirit. It's pushed by Musk, pushed by Bezos, right? You know, in some way, the largest country-led initiative is from China, which is in some ways scary because the only organized governmental uh, agency that is pursuing this uh, this space um, uh, aggressively is the is the government of China. You know, at least to that level. You know, Russia's kind of trying to hold on, but China's full steam ahead. You know, yeah. Musk and you know and and Bezos are, are full steam ahead. I, I imagine that you know Bezos's uh, idea here is he's just looking for more storage space for his warehouse, his Amazon.com. Like he knows that. He, he could have unlimited storage. He could put servers for AWS, like you know, uh, you know, all over the place. He could launch satellites and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. 
uh, I kind of feel like Musk is much more of a uh, explorer, you know? I kind yeah, of feel he's like not, he's, he's doing it. There. He's doing he's, it for the sake oh, of this side of it. He but says we're I don't finish. think I don't think that Musk's intentions are to solve like world overcrowding. Like he, he's very clear that his agenda is building his companies, but also trying and exploring new vistas, like like a kid in a candy shop. That's like Musk with technology. Like, let's explore this, let's explore that. It's not something that you see often that he's kind of doing it for the stated aim, like, you know, uh, with the Gates Foundation, we want to put up these uh, satellites to give places that have that have no internet free internet. Like, when Facebook tells you that they're going to provide you free internet, it's because they're not satisfied with spying on this part of the world. We want to get that part of the world that we can't spy on because they don't have internet. <laughs> like, you see what I'm saying? So they're going to monetize everybody. Um, but you're right. If the, the the way we decide whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing is by uh, analyzing, you know, its purpose and its uh, benef benefits to humanity. You know, right now, there's, there's no absolutely no one looking over the shoulder and saying this needs to be for some altruistic reason. It's it's purely driven by entre an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, largely based in capitalism, you know? There's no doubt about it. And Elon Musk has said that he wants to do, he wants to die on Mars. He said it. And he, well, he has his car there already. <laughs> yes, it's, orbiting. it's orbiting, it's orbiting Mars. It's not on. How and ironic would it be if he died he in a car to... accident? <laughs> If they're like two spaceships in Mars. Yeah, well, what's going to end up happening is some guys going to go out there and bring it back, and that's going to be the story. He also said that he wants to. He sees Mars as a landing place to build new stuff to go even further. Right. And they're, they're ten steps ahead. These people. They're like that in business. Elon Musk's like motivation isn't just to play in the uh, in the uh, economic playground or in a you know just for exploration. He believes that he's solving problems. Like he believes that you know that the environment is an issue, um, and therefore the way you lower carbon emissions is through electric vehicles, through battery, you know, battery storage. Uh, Tesla is more of a of a uh, of a power company than it is a car company. It's more of a big data company with you know autonomous driving than it is a car company. That's the real value in Tesla, not the cars. Everyone's making cars, but I think what's motivating you know him is uh, the fact that he believes he's solving problems for humanity. It's a disruptive technology, but that with the intention of solving problems. It was, um, the idea was based on um, Steve Jobs. He says that, that the goal of Apple is to leave a ding in the universe. Like he wants to make an impact. You know, I wanna, I wanna leave a dent somewhere. And, I, and that was like uh, this very ominous kind of like uh, moonshot of, you know, but with Musk, funny say, you, know, you mentioned him, but his me dot. I was actually funny right. just reading a lot about Steve Our Jobs. Person. Terrible person. Whoever met him said he was the nastiest person. But we always say, what do we leave this world with? Ah, the best <laughs> That's nice. Um, but you know what though? I, I kind of feel like you're right. The only you know the only one that knows in the hearts and minds of men is Borel Olam, is God Himself. Um, it's hard to know if that's rhetoric. Like today, companies are being told that they have to have a story, a human interest story. They have to source their coffee in an organic place where you know workers are getting foot rubs by you know uh, people that they're shipping in from America. You know, preferably rich people who now are degraded the you know standard of living of the coffee growers. Like the more heartwarming the story is, the more they're selling a product. So on some level, there's this kind of crossover today in the uh, in the financial world where the stories that you tell about social conscience and uh, and tikkun olam are really still only driven by a desire to make an even bigger buck, like you know. Yeah. And and uh, look, I mean, must, must, this must, mission you know, that we himself a couple of times, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Like he has not said, and this is what I would expect to hear from someone whose end goal is to solve overcrowding in the earth, by the way, which to me is a ridiculous goal because every single country on earth, like almost all of them are not making enough people to even replace their current populations, never mind exceed their populations. So this concept of overcrowding, which they used to be worried about in a, in a world where as you had more money, 
you had more kids and and people kept making more money after the industrial revolution technological revolution you know we've actually seen the opposite happen so there's kind of been this falling off a cliff so i don't know that that's necessarily a viable need but um in whatever cases i've not heard musk say and it is my fervent wish to donate the first hundred thousand seats to people who make less than five thousand dollars a year you know what i mean I heard that and i would expect not to hear that not that was missing and eric is it ain't coming it's going to cost a lot of money to get people inside those spaceships but you know something else with this over you know this has been a very we'd rather speak about bitcoin <laughs> a very fractured time for america right and the whole world think about the unity the achtut the world has felt over this landing on mars it really was like become one of the best stories that's come out in a number of months people are really connected to this and it's brought a tremendous amount of achtut unity to a very fractured society mm -hmm. yeah all right, so how do we let, let's let's close this conversation because we could go on like this forever. Um, so uh, ultimately, we're saying that um, you know, is it worth investing in? Uh, uh, well, is it worth spending all that money in, uh, going to Mars? I think we're saying yes, it's worth it because the um, the it's uh, cool. That's cool. why it's, it's cool. cool. Not just because it's cool, it's because the the uh, the uh, the whatever the outgrowth is of this particular project has much more a much greater a profound impact on humanity than the, whatever money we're spending anyway right so compare it to, to art and museums as an example yeah you know, the amount of money we're pouring into the preservation of old paintings painted by some master i'm not saying that it's not worthwhile i'm saying its value is an intangible gift to humanity and like you said the moonshot the idea you could send to mars that countries could kind of combine and you, there's a united there's an international space station that belongs to all countries i mean these concepts i mean they've got to be worth you know uh, a tremendous amount of money and uh, uh again but you probably like most things they need it needs a it needs a big brother some form of international regulation to ensure that you know china doesn't put military bases on the moon and then become you know, able to launch missiles, you know, from every to every country in the world simultaneously. Don't scare me. Oh, my God. All right. Let's leave on a happy note over there. <laughs> yeah. Re regulation is a very interesting topic. We should have a conversation that they about regulation. Okay. Is, is regulation good? Is it a force for good or force for bad? Because it's everywhere in schooling, in education, in finances, and, mm -hmm. you know, in taxation and in, in, in technology. You know this concept and what happens when you deregulate you know what happens in a space where you pull back it's really interesting to talk about and i think with regards to space that's also a fascinating uh angle okay very cool all right everyone thank you so much for listening uh this was a beta test that you're kind of like you know peeking into this kind of a conversation i think it's really cool there's so much there's so much you could do here by the way as far as just like i could have i could have 10 speakers like this by the way side by side um, you know, I don't think it would work with ten people, but um, visually it looks really cool. I and can. I think, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing. This. We're gonna take a different idea from the news every week, and we're going to analyze it from a Jewish perspective, from a United States perspective, maybe political perspective. So every week, if you're interested, uh, pick a topic, do email us, be in touch with us. Um, but we're gonna basically rip something out of the news and uh, and break it down. So this was part one, and uh, there'll be many more of these, God willing, coming up every Sunday night. These videos will be uh, stored on our Chazak YouTube page. You can find it at youtube.com. Just type in Chazak, and you'll find us. Every one of the classes, all the rabbis, all the classes are all stored there. It's an encyclopedia of information, knowledge, and wisdom. Please subscribe and join. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Laila Tov. We'll see you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Cool, too, everyone. Have a good night.